track record with your hosts Mike Shea and Robert Yetter. Brought to you by Eventide Entertainment. Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Track Record. My name is Robert Yetter. My name is Mike Shea. And we thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, it should be what we like to call a... Um, the the opposite of diarrhea, right? The uh, the uh, pretty much the cum show. Yeah, the cum show. It's gonna be like um, like bukaki. So bukaki. Let's just start this off real <laughs> dirty. <laughs> we're about to we're about to give you a musical pearl necklace. Ooh, that's right. I, I went classy with it. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, we're the, uh, we're the biggest couple so, of idiots ever. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, but you can say whatever you want on the internet, can't you? Oh yeah, right. Hell Pretty, yeah. Well, maybe not. In, not not in this day and age. I would. I wouldn't recommend saying certain things, but yeah, like um, no, I won't say. It. I don't <laughs> even want. I I can't even give the example no. because I don't want to. Like uh, you know, that'll be the end. Uh, be uh persecuted for anything <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah track record what episode are we on now are we on like nine this is, is gonna be episode ooh, nine i think so yeah where are we up there oh i think so track record if you just this is episode just, nine yeah this is episode yeah. nine hot damn that means nine weeks that we've been jackasses on the internet <laughs> Well, on this podcast, for I've been this a show, yeah. on the internet for a long time. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, maybe maybe on my old Facebook before I deleted it because there were too many uh, liberals. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, anyway, I have I like I feel like I want to say political things, um, but it just it's not fitting. I don't know. The show's more like, okay, have you ever seen um, Parks and Recreation? I'm sure everyone's seen that show, Absolutely. Right? You know, the radio show with Nick Kroll, yeah. whatever, whatever, and the douche. Yeah. Like, we're like, we're more along the lines of that shit rather than <laughs> like a... <laughs> I like it. I like it. <laughs> maybe, maybe, you know, a, a step more in the intelligence direction. But, but pretty much just like just fart as, noises and, and <laughs> you know, ball jokes. Or, or just as douchey. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different smell. A different smell of douche. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, you know, I want to, I just want to like express to the world how I feel. But sometimes like I feel like I can't because my views are are the ones pretty much that are being suppressed, I think. Um I think you and, and I are, are similar in that I mean I'm 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 pretty damn liberal, admittedly, but I do have yeah. some views that are more conservative. I'm kind of a mixed bag politically. Yeah, but but you are not so liberal as to throw away the concept of rationality. Right. And um I'm I'm a just I'm a true liberal as opposed to like a left wing lipstick libtard liberal. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I'm not one of I those, totally get that. I'm not one of those guys who just uh, is. I'm not anti conservative. Let me put it that way. I'm liberal, but I'm not anti conservative. Right. You're you're a liberal that can hang with a you know have an intelligent conversation with a conservative i'm capable of seeing two sides instead of just issue. throwing out the term uh fascism or yeah, racism or sexism or yeah bigotry like those are why are those such terms i don't know i don't believe um, in i don't believe in blanket statements phobic like, yeah anyway so phobic anyway let's uh oh yeah uh oh yeah oh yeah the show let's do oh, a yeah. show <laughs> The, <laughs> um all right i feel like we need uh to get some alcohol sponsors i think because so too. we talk about our alcohol every episode one of these days we're so, gonna get some kind of brewery or something to sponsor this damn show 
you know, I feel like I want to make it the brewery of what I'm drinking right now. What you got? And and I showed you a, a little video of me drinking this oh, yesterday. Oh, bastard. And it's the uh, Not Your Father's Mountain Ale. And it's essentially like a hard Mountain Dew. See, I tried to find some today, and they were out. And I don't know where it came from or when they started making this, but I saw, like, this fluorescent green shit. <laughs> I was like, no way, that's Mountain Dew. <laughs> and lo and behold, it's like, it's a hard Mountain Dew, man. Dude. Um, That in conjunction with shots of a grapefruit rum. Grapefruit rum. Yeah. That is something different, I, I, man. I'm a, it is, it's a little, I like the grapefruit vodka better. Right. Um, the grapefruit rum is definitely harder to take. Well, rum has but such a, I'm, I'm a sucker for that, for the grapefruit stuff. I don't know what it is. Rum has such a distinct flavor on its own. Vodka just kind of tastes like nothing. And so I think you can get away with the grapefruit flavored vodkas more than you can. Like I've had cherry rum and cherry rum is delicious, but cherry anything is delicious. Um, yeah. But, oh, black cherry stuff. Oh, yeah. But yeah, grapefruit rum, just like, because rum is already sweet on its own and has a distinct, even even regular rum has like a slight spiced flavor overtone to it. Right. So, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to find some and give it a try. At the store I was at today, they didn't have the grapefruit rum, and they didn't have, they had the Not Your Father's stuff, but they were out of the dew, the, the mountain ale. Yeah. So, I got some other stuff, though. Cool. What you drinking? Right now, I am drinking a Cider Boys Grand Mimosa, which is an apple orange mimosa cider. It's basically an apple cider that was brewed with uh, oranges and champagne. Made uh, that is nuts. It's great. It's made from these guys in Wisconsin, and there just happens to be hey, the, uh, shout out the uh, the bar that I perform at has a liquor store attached to it where they sell the stuff they serve. So uh, brilliant. Got, I got a bottle of this. It's dangerous because it goes down so smoothly that you don't even realize you're drinking it all. You kind of have like a almost like an urge to take huge gulps of it before you know. Yeah, it's, gone. it's like this Mountain Dew because like the way that I drink a Mountain Dew, which I'm pretty sure is the same way everyone else drinks Mountain Dew, is that you fucking you drink that shit. You open up your you open up your throat and you pour that shit <laughs> right down. And open the throat, so. relax the jaw. Don't forget to cup the balls. That's right. You gotta, you gotta turn, you gotta turn the boot, right? Turn the, turn boot. the boot. <laughs> yeah. I almost bought one at the store today. They had them. They had boots. You know what they have at the liquor store near me is a, it's just a big ass. It's like a hockey stick, but it's just filled with vodka. Oh, I'm in. It's not like real full like hockey stick size, but it's like half of that. But it's like a big ass stick of vodka. Ooh. It's crazy. That sounds good. I also bought a bottle of uh, Honey Oak Mead, which I might might break out before the show's over if it gets cold enough in my fridge. We'll see. There you go. So, yeah, we need to get some booze sponsors on this show because... I think it's fitting. I think so, too. I think it's fitting. So, we'll see. Um, so, we got the booze out of the way. We're feeling nice and... I'm, I'm feeling nice and toasty. I'm feeling um, good. As, as always, <laughs> on this show. Uh, last week, we had a, a interesting episode, kind of a different style. It was uh, different in many different ways. Different genre, pun intended. Um, so we, we were talking about the epitome of pop, and you chose Michael Jackson, Dangerous, yeah. and I chose Kylie Minogue, Fever. And uh, what was your score for that? I, mm, I, you gave it a two. I, think I gave it two or two and a half. Okay, I think two. And I gave Michael a three, maybe. I think you gave you it a two and a, a half. Two? So I don't we know. Were, I, was I drunk. guess we were not. Uh, we were kind of. Yeah, <laughs> I was drunk. <laughs> Drunker than I realized uh, I was. But I, well, I drank straight. Like I think. That's probably. I got the glass sitting next to me. I think I drank like a straight twelve ounces of. of it was of, a big cup, bourbon. and and I and if you go if you play back the episode from last week, you'll hear me remarking about how 
big of a cup that is. <laughs> yeah. And also, when you pause to take a big ass chug, you drink like half of that shit. I did towards the end of the episode. Hence, why I, I downgraded to a cider this week. There you go. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a different kind of episode. It was, I think, it was a little more. I hate overusing this word, but deep. I think it's probably deeper that we've gotten on this show because we were really exploring what made the albums what they were yeah and why we felt they were it really it really went beyond yeah it really went beyond music too it it went beyond that it went to personas of the artists the you know how they portray themselves stuff like that so i guess it was pretty deep yeah well we'll we'll see what happens this week because i think this week We've got we've got some heavy hitters this week is the thing. Like the yeah. the two albums we have this week are known. Let's let's put it that way. It is known. It is very known. What is that from? I don't know. It sounds like a poo from uh, the Simpsons. It is known. No. no Welcome to the known. Quickie Mart. It's like Avatar or some shit. Oof, man, you're dating me at that point. I uh watched Avatar in forever. Yeah. Is he making a second one of those? Ah, What's up knows? with that? Who the hell knows? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, oh, well. so last week, this week, I think we're going to, oof, we're, I, we may or may not piss some people off with some of the thoughts we have. I don't know how you felt. I don't know how I felt. And Why would we piss people off? Because these are albums people are protective of, and they they evoke emotions, certain emotions in people. Okay. We'll see though. I could be I could be way off base, considering I had no idea that our episode about septic flesh and lunar soul was gonna get as much love overnight as it did. Same with uh, yeah, the baby that true. the baby metal episode that one overnight. Yeah, uh, it's the it's the weird ones. Well, so we'll see about this one. Um, okay. So why don't you uh, take a second and just tell everybody about what album you gave me, and we'll we'll go from there. All right. So you listened to what many people would consider the uh, epitome, I think, of classic rock, and that is Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Uh, and, and I, I mentioned last week that it was kind of a a safe choice, you know, that's pretty much, it's a cliche choice, but it's a choice that I had to make because I, I really didn't see, I, I, I I was maybe bouncing it between some of the earlier stuff or like the wall or, uh, animals. Um, but I really couldn't see any piece of work that was more influential in that time than Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. Um, I'm pretty sure everyone has some pretty intimate, you know, memories with this album. And um, it's pretty much iconic, you know, you you see the, you see that symbol, you know, the, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, the the rainbow uh, and the the triangle, you know, the beam of light turning into a rainbow. Um, what do you call that? A prism? Yeah, it's uh, the light is ref- is uh, refracting to the prism. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Um, and so everyone everyone knows about Dark Side of the Moon, and it's very a very uh, Pink Floyd was futuristic, man. They were some of the first to pioneer that really the the psychedelic rock, you know, uh, pretty much just go on a trip with rock music uh, more than any other band, and and they were doing things that were so experimental for the time. They were they were way ahead of their time, way ahead of their time. Uh, so there, I mean, there's there's not much. It's it's just it is what it is. It's Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. I don't know. It, I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, so. yeah. I mean, how how do you how do you introduce one of the albums in classic rock? 
I yeah. mean, everyone knows the album cover. Yeah, it's everyone. If they don't, they're an idiot. I mean, <laughs> I'm sorry. If you don't know immediately the album cover for Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, you've been living under a rock your entire life. Most definitely. Um, so, first of all, last week when you said Pink Floyd, I was almost certain you were going to give me the wall. I really do. Really? I, 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 I thought you were going to give me the wall, and I'm actually so thrilled you didn't. Not because okay. I have a problem with the wall. I actually thought the wall would have been the safe choice. Really? Because I feel like nowadays you say the words Pink and Floyd, everyone's first reaction is the wall. Yeah, I mean, it had, um, what's the song? About, uh, we don't need no education. Yeah. And, I mean, the wall. Breaking the wall, that's what it is. Yeah, the wall was fine. Um, I, mm, I think the wall is actually a bit overrated, but it's a fine album. Like. It's not bad in any way, shape, or form. But okay, I, right. I just I just think the wall is a tiny like it's good. But I hear people gush about the wall, and I'm like, okay, guys, it's 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 not that good. It's good. It's not that good. It's not life changing. Oh. I didn't think it was life changing. But dark side of the I have moon. To, I have to agree with the. I think the wall, the whole the you know the the dual album, the double album. Mm-hmm. There a lot of filler type stuff in there. Yeah. But with that being said, I think Dark Side of the Moon is a far more influential and game-changing album. Um, time, oh, yeah. t- time is a song that I've been familiar with for a long time that I've, I've actually heard uh, covered a couple of times. Uh, one of my preferred covers of the song is by Godsmack. Um, they did a two disc album a few years ago called live and inspired. The live part was a live album and the inspired part was an EP of covers. And one of them was time by pink Floyd. Cool. And, and I dug that cover and I forgot that that song was on dark side of the moon until I had it playing. And then I heard the, doo, 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 thank you. I was like, Oh yeah, I forgot that was on this album. <laughs> and it's a great song. I love the song time. I love what this song, this album does at the beginning, which is this minute and a half instrumental introductory track that just builds and builds and builds and crescendos gradually to the end where it's big and it's big and it's huge. And then we jump right into breathe and it's very calm. Mm -hmm. Like you're walking up, like you're running to the top of the mountain and you're just jumping off and you land in a pool or in a lake or something. Um, Something about the way that that Pink Floyd structures their albums and that kind of it's very dynamic in that sense. You know, um, the album has an amazing flow to it. It flows not I don't want to say seamlessly, but damn near seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Um, The the way the songs are they're 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 not just like standard verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, verse, chorus songs. Um, there's, there's more to them than that in the arrangements, in the structure. Um, Pink Floyd was a band that was well ahead of their time. I I do, I do think so. Um, and I mean that in a good way. Agreed. Um, I can't, I can't imagine the kind of ground groundbreaking Pink Floyd would make today if they started today. When you see stuff like Imagine Dragons gaining as much popularity as it is, which I listen to Imagine Dragons and I hear a heavy Pink Floyd influence in what they do. I know I'm not the biggest fan, but you can hear the Pink Floyd influence in what they do, I think. Yeah, I hear you. Like I said, I'm not not, not a fan, but (laughs) you can hear the influence from Pink Floyd in their music. Don't be a fan. (laughs) Um, money is an interesting song to me. It really is. I can't, I can't decide if, if I like the intro or not. 
The song itself is legit, that, but the intro is weird. That's probably one of my my least favorite Pink Floyd songs. It's, actually, it's not. It's yeah. It's definitely not on my top list. Uh, like if I had to make like a top five Pink Floyd songs, wouldn't make the list. But yeah, it's just man. I don't know what what you say about this album that hasn't already been said. I will say this in doing some research. I had never heard of the whole Wizard of Oz thing. I'd never heard of that. You never heard of that? I had never heard of that. And that had never, I know one never. Wow. Yeah. I was almost tempted to go find my copy of the Wizard of Oz. Okay, for those who don't know what we're talking about, there's this long standing meme called Dark Side of the Rainbow. And the idea is that you can play Dark Side of the Moon simultaneously alongside of the Wizard of Oz. And I guess it. It pairs up like perfectly. Yeah, it and, just matches the 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 mood, the you know scene changes. Like it's weird. Well, like the uh, the the couple references I found online is that um, at the part at the part of the film where Dorothy starts running is when the lyric uh, in during time, "No one told you when to run," kicks in. Yeah, and in the song "Breathe," there's the line "balanced on the biggest wave," and if you play them side by side, that happens as she's walking on a tightrope fence, like doing a tightrope walk on a fence. Yeah, is when you hear the lyric "balanced on the biggest wave." I had never heard of this before, and now that's surprising. Yeah, like I watching this, I just kept thinking to myself, "How have I never heard about this?" The, like. As much of a music fan and as a much of a film fan as I am, like, I don't know. I don't know how this one passed me by. I don't know. But I'm so glad I know about it now because I'm going to fucking do it. I'm going to go find my copy of Wizard of Oz because I'm one of those film fans that owns a copy of The Wizard of Oz. It is a fantastic movie. I don't care what anybody says. Um, oh, I don't think anyone would disagree, man. If they do, they're idiots i'm gonna say that a lot today <laughs> yeah um idiots it's all idiots yeah fucking guys uh one thing i always forget about too is i always forget that time has that uh that call back to breathe in it part way through mm-hmm. which i always every time i, cause I always forget that because like i have time on my phone but i don't have i didn't have the whole album on my phone i just had time and because it's been it has been years since I've listened to Dark Side of the Moon beginning to end, like yeah. like I was in like a freshman in high school I think the last time I listened to this album beginning to end, and I forgot about that and I was just like Jesus Christ this is so good. Um, Roger Waters remains to this day one of my favorite bass players of all time. Yeah, I love the way that man walks that bass with his fingers. Just Jesus Christ. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and I also love how much Roger Waters is involved in the songwriting. You know. Oh yeah, I, yeah. It, it um, there the the three guys. The um, oh, if I had it pulled up right now, I'd be I'd be uh, better. Ro- but uh, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, and David Gilmore are the three main songwriters. Yes, th- those three guys, and and they they admit that Wright was actually you know the way that he the way that he played guitar and and stuff was he was or he played guitar and he played keyboard, right? He was yeah. On this one, he was just keyboards. David Gilmore did all the uh, guitars for this album. Yeah. It, so they they always cited Wright as one of the the forefront of the writers, and he had you know kind of the most um, the the freshest ideas and yeah. kind of which is the, uh, which is strange because he's only got writing credit on one two three five of the songs. Yeah, and I th- I think this comes this this came about a, a lot later oh, okay. where um you know I was reading with uh, um Gilmore was talking about Wright um and th- around the time of Division Bell and how you know they thought that he was that 
what was in his mind musically was very innovative. Mm-hmm. Um, I love that Speak to Me is written exclusively by Nick Mason. I think Nick Mason is a fantastic drummer. And to do what he did with the tape, because back then, you know, it wasn't like nowadays where you can create sound effects and shit on your computer to make the, yeah. those were all tape effects. Right. And he did a, he did a wonderful job with that. I thought, but you but Roger Waters songwriting, because Roger Waters has writing credit on all but one song on the album. He doesn't have a credit on great gig in the sky. Oh my God. I want that man to write the soundtrack to my life. Whenever whenever I think of that song, Great Gig in the Sky, mm-hmm. I think of School of Rock. I remember oh. when, when Jack Black is handing out the CDs and he's and he's talking to he's like, Here's Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. You know, she's, he's talking to one of the girls that's gonna be a vocalist. Yeah. And he's like, Listen to the vocal solo and Great Gig in the Sky. That's gonna be your inspiration for your vocals for forever. Hell yeah. And man, is that the most accurate shit ever. Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, like, like all seriousness, if you are a lover of rock music, school of rock is a movie you need to watch. Oh yeah. The appreciation that, cause it's Jack Black at the helm, the appreciation that movie shows to rock music and really just hits the nail on the head with some of the statements it makes is, is just, that is an underappreciated movie. I really do think it is. I think so. Yeah. If you're a musician or a music fan, School of Rock is a must-watch. It's a must-own, I think. It's a fantastic film. But anyway, um, yeah, Money Money is probably the one track on the album. I'm just like, eh, eh, it's all right. Um, doesn't, it really doesn't fit. It, I it, don't think it fits with it, the rest of the no, stuff. No, it feels out of place. Yeah. Um, the first time I listened to this album, I was in seventh grade. And even I remember thinking like, did I put like, did, did I put the right record on? Cause my, this is, I was listening to it on an actual vinyl on, uh, one of my dad's old vinyls. Oh, and, fancy. Yeah. I was just like, did, did I put, is this the same album? Dad, did something get screwed up? It's just yeah. Weird. The whole, the whole vibe changes, you know, between the, the, the musicians, uh, their, Oh man, the alcohol's kicking in. Uh, <laughs> between the instrumentation and the the lyricism, there yeah. we go. That's what I was trying to say before it was all slurry. <laughs> but I will say, like, once you hit us and them, it, it all comes back. Yeah, it's just that one song. Um, it's not a bad song. It's just it's out of place. It could, Agreed. Something else should have been there. I don't know, but. Yeah, I mean, like, we were going for epitome of a classic rock album, and, uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. Oh, Finally, it's there a we show go. now. <laughs> um, yeah, like, you know, we were going for the epitome of a rock album, and if, if you're ever making your own list of, you know, top five greatest classic rock albums of all time, if this isn't, like, number one or two, yeah. num- number two, because I think mine is number one, but... <laughs> Number two, at least, Ooh. man, like, Jesus Christ. I mean, like, again, what can I say about this album that has not been said over the last 30 years? No, you're right, but we can still dote on it anyway. Oh, we're doting on it, man. For an album written in 73, man, 73, mm-hmm. coming out of Abbey Road, just, that's another that's thing I look about this. It was recorded at Abbey Road Studios, man. Yeah. That's just, man, it's one day. I'd love to record at Abbey Road one day. Um, One day. The 70s were a good time. 70s man. were. 70s are like, everyone dotes on the 80s. And the 80s were fantastic. I love the 80s. I, I could go for the 80s, too. <laughs> but, but like, like the 70s, man, that's where it all started. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Queen, Pink Floyd... Judas Priest, I mean, Sabbath, all these great bands started in the 70s. And just, yeah, we're still talking about them to this day. That's right. And I think a big part of that, 
and and we'll we'll get to this much later in the show, but just the structure of this album was so you could tell had a massive influence on albums to come from other bands and other artists later on down the road. Yeah. Just oh my god. And and that's again, like I hadn't listened to this thing beginning to end since my freshman year of high school. And so taking a night like what we usually do is we rec- we record this show on Saturdays and then Sunday nights is when I usually will sit down after I get home from work, pull up whatever album was given to me, throw it on the headphones and just kick back and give it a once through right away, man. The old took- in out in out. Yeah, this one, this one took me back, man. Like it was so fun to just get lost in this album again. Saying it's it's like a it's like a drug without the without the drug. <laughs> it's like a drug without the risk of losing your job. Or your teeth. Or your teeth. Or your dignity. Hey. Yeah. I don't have dignity anymore. Um Nah. So yeah, this is one that like and now and now with the advent of digital music and all that, like going back and revisiting this again is gonna be that much easier. Because, again, mm. I, freshman year of high school, iTunes wasn't exactly a thing. Um, you know, Spotify, Pandora, online stuff, that wasn't a thing. So you had to go out and buy your CDs, kids. You had to go to stores Ooh, in public. Well, um, Morpheus was a thing. True, Morpheus was a Napster. thing. Napster. Napster was, well, actually, at this point, Napster was gone for a while, but it came back. I forget what I was using. I was using Morpheus and no, you know, was it Live Wire? It was li- live Wire? Li- Lime Wire. That Lime Wire, that, that's what it is. That fucking horrendous piece of computer aids. Nothing like downloading a song over dial up internet. Yeah. Nothing like it. Knowing that you are destroying your computer from the inside out. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just I mean I'm, just I'm, not, like, I'm not kidding when I call it that computer aids. I mean, you were raping your computer. With an STD ridden penis by using LimeWire, yeah, and then oh, Frost yeah. FrostWire came after it, which was the same thing, just blue. <laughs> I don't remember that. Uh, I think that was when I started making my own music, so I was like, ah, eh. right. But whatever, man. This was just this was such an adventure. It was a great adventure to go back on, kind of like going back to your favorite vacation spot from when you were a kid and you haven't been there in ten years. And just, yeah, it's that shit is timeless, man. You can you, you can listen to that in forty years from now, and you'd be like, "Oh my god, that shit is innovative." Like, at, at the same time, it pissed me off because it made me relive high school. I don't want to relive high school. Fuck high school, man. <laughs> it's Aww. like I'm getting lost in this. Oh, fucking Becky, she broke up with me, man. So <laughs> you can't worry about high school girls, man. <laughs> high school never ends. Um, <laughs> I managed to work a Bowling for Soup reference into this show. That's yay. That takes some fucking talent. On that note, though, um, I don't know what else I can say. I don't. I don't know what else I can say about this fucking album. It's so good, so goddamn good. Actually, that's the the second Bowling for Soup reference that's been made on this show. Is it? Which other one? Did Our we very make? first episode, I called Alestorm the. The pirate metal oh, bowling for soup. Oh, that's right, you did. Bowling for soup's a guilty pleasure of mine. Really, yeah. <laughs> emphasis maybe. on emphasis on the guilty. <laughs> like I listen to it, and I'm like, why do I? It's like train. It's like why do I like this? No, don't say train. <laughs> maybe train from like twenty years ago. Oh well, yeah, train when like Drops of Jupiter came out. Yeah. Was good. Hey, Soul Sister can go fuck itself. <laughs> but, oh, my God. It's so bad. Anyway. Fucking shit, <laughs> man. Um, it's just, yeah. I, what's your stars, bro? What's your st- uh, three and a half on this one. What? I'm, you ain't going to go a full fucking four? I'm docking half a star for money. Dude. Docking half a star I, I for money. I got no fucking man. respect for you, man. <laughs> Fine, I'll go three point seven five. I'm gonna get weird. Oh, with this. I gotta, I gotta dock something for money. I don't know. I gotta dock I something I for know. money. It's Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the I'm, Moon. Just I'm think aware. about how it made you feel. 
Oh, right I in know. The, right in the fucking root of your and, of your and then, genitalia, man. And, yeah, and then when money starts playing and I hear a cash register being opened and closed repeatedly, it took me out of it. Hmm. I got it. Right. I get a three and a half. I'll Fine. Give it three and a half. Fine. Be the guy who 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 rates Dark Side of the Moon three and a half out of four. <laughs> I fucking will. You, you sure you want to be that guy? I do want to be. I, I always want to be that guy. I love being that guy. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um. Yeah. But like, seriously, like, I, I'm, I, I can't stroke this album's dick anymore. I mean, like, it's so good. Good. It's just, it's, it's one of the penultimate albums to get the fuck lost in for an hour. Sit back, yes, throw on the headphones, lay your head down on a pillow, close your eyes, and just get fucking lost in it. Mm. It's like, um. Like little whispers of melody, just like if you were naked on your bed and it was like, you know, your sheets were all cool and shit. It's like these whispers of melody just like flitting around your nipples and through every (laughs) crevice of your body. It's just like it it encompasses you. This is this is sex in musical form. Yeah. Not, not, Not just sex. This is like this is the most passionate, romantic Two people becoming one, their souls and hearts joining kind of sex ever in music form. Yeah. Except you only rated it three and a half out of four. So. I, I did because even even really, really good sex has that brief 10 seconds where you're shifting around and getting in the right position to keep going. Yeah. Or you think about like, a, you know, the <laughs> right. state of the world or something. <laughs> you momentarily <laughs> pop out of it and then you're right back in. Yeah. And by pop out, I mean mentally. I don't mean anyway. Let's let's go from there. <laughs> so yeah, man, it's you know what? Fuck it, I'm giving it four. Thank you. I can't. Shit, I can't. Man. Like even for money, I just damn it, man. It's too good. This is an this is an example of an album that's just too goddamn good. Okay. It, like this, four out of four. Four out of four. This one gets that's four. All out I was four, trying man. to get. Is this the first four out of four we've had? Yep. Man, four out of fucking four. It's dark Beautiful. side. It's dark side of the moon by Pink Floyd. I mean, come the fuck on. Like yeah. I said, this is like almost. This is almost cheating. Expect? This is almost cheating. <laughs> we got the cheat codes for this bitch. Goddamn right we do. Fuck it, man. Jesus. All right. All right. So yeah, uh, you got anything else you want to add, man? At this point. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I think I made my point. Uh, Abundantly clear. Oh, and shit. also, did you? Uh, yeah. If you have never heard Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, as soon as this podcast is over. Should we should we worry about a younger generation like not being exposed to this? I do. Is it too, is it too old for them? I worry. Like, I worry about that kind of shit all the time. That, that like teenagers that that you know in this time are they listening to this t- stuff? They so, have to, right? I mean, some are. They got to be going. They got to be rifling through their their mother or father's you know music collection. Well, let, me, let me let me whatever. Expl- looking let me exp- at their iPod, be like, what the hell is Pink Floyd? Let me explain how I got introduced to Pink Floyd. And I think this might give you some sense of relief. Mm-hmm. Um, I got I first heard of Pink Floyd. I had heard of Pink Floyd. I'd never listened to him, but I was, um, oof, like I said, like in middle school. And I have a younger cousin. I'm not going to say his name because he's a prick. If any of my family are listening right now, they know who the fuck I'm talking about. Oh, OK, but he's a prick. And when I was first getting into rock music. Um, does he have the same last name? No, he does not. Okay. He's not on my Facebook. You won't be able to find him. Well, sorry, internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, uh, when I was first getting into rock music, where like all I knew was basically like three or four bands. I knew Linkin Park. I knew Stained. I knew System of a Down. And I knew Three Days Grace. And I was like, fucking it. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay. I'm cranking him out today, man. Thanks, so. so we went to go visit my grandparents and they had digital cable when digital cable was first a thing. Oh, snaps. And it had those music channels. You know, the ones I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah. So like in the nine hundreds or some shit. Yeah. So my cousin who was because my uncle's really big into classic rock. And so he was flipping through to the classic rock one. 
and uh, Brick in the Wall came on. It was actually the mm-hmm. first Pink Floyd song I heard. I was like, what is that? That is cool. And it just so happened that at that time, because my grandparents had HBO, the wall, the movie wall was on HBO On Demand. So we pulled up Pink Floyd's The Wall and we watched it and listened to it. And I was like, so this is Pink Floyd. I've heard of Pink Floyd. And then from there is when I went and found Dark Side of the Moon. Mm-hmm. So that that and again, the wall is a fantastic album. It was I the, think that was, was that was probably my first experience too. Yeah. That was, was that movie. That was the first experience to Pink Floyd I had. So I, I, yeah, so to go off what I was saying earlier, The Wall is a great album. It's the reason I like Pink Floyd. It's the reason I have a broader love for rock and all of its subgenres. I just think it's overrated because Dark Side of the Moon is the one that made me go, okay, I'm a Pink Floyd fan now. Yeah. Um, what about Animals? You know, Animals is the shit. Are you kidding me? Animals is my personal favorite. Animals is the shit. Um, Fuck yeah. But no, I, I agree. Like The Wall was probably my first experience too. I remember being over at a friend's house um, and th- that movie was playing. And I just remember the only part of the movie I remember is the, is the businessman. There's like, yeah. like a hundred of them, like all like, you know, moving in motion together. Like, I don't remember. They all have their briefcases and it was that's that, all I remember of that. Had that sexy ass old school animation to it. Ooh, sexy. God, it was so good. Oh yeah. But man, the wall, the wall is good. I just think Dark Side of the Moon is better. <laughs> yeah, agreed. Um, and it was so it was so great reading up about the whole Wizard of Oz thing too. Yeah, I hope you try that. I will, and I think I think that's what It'll I'm gonna I'm gonna use that to justify bumping it up to four because money kind of let me down, but learning about the Wizard of Oz thing that's too fucking cool. Like, oh yeah, I love shit. I love shit like that. I love. Well, and they they have vehemently said it was completely coincidental, and that's fine. Yeah, but but it's I, just a cool Easter egg, man. Yeah, I love shit like that. I love Easter eggs. Yeah. So, but yeah, man. All right, groovy man. So I think I think that should appease the audience. I hope so too. I, I give it four out of four, guys. What the fuck else do you want from me here? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna. We're going to take a quick break and listen to myself and Robert uh, talk about some good shit that's going on here on on Eventide. And I'm going to go get another drink and we're going to come back and we're going to hear what Robert has to say about the album I gave him. So stick around. You know, there's nothing quite as satisfying as a good conversation with intelligent company. Join comedian Don Smith every week as he sits down and talks with comedians, actors, filmmakers, writers, and everyday schmoes. It's The Life with Don Smith, Wednesdays at noon on 106.9 FM, and now available on the Eventide Entertainment Podcast feed every Friday on Spreaker, YouTube, and iTunes. Nerd Versus, Mondays at 9 a.m., Eventide Entertainment Podcast Feed. Are you into making music, videos, or podcasts? Are you a local comedic talent in need of some much-needed publicity? Are you a behind-the-scenes professional interested in audio-video production, graphic design, and public relations? Eventide Entertainment is actively seeking talents, clients, and professionals to help our business grow into something truly special. And we want you to be one of those. For more information, go to facebook.com slash eventideentertainment or send us an email at eventideent at gmail.com. And welcome back to this week's episode of Track Record. Hope you guys enjoyed the announcements from me and Robert. And now you are rejoined with me and Robert. So that's right. That's how this works. Uh, we just heard my thoughts <laughs> on Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd. 
Gave it a whopping four out of four stars. Can't do any That's better right. than I'm that, proud people. of you, boy. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Um, I've switched drinks. I finished my my uh, my mimosa cider, and I've now switched over to uh, Honey Oak Mead, brewed by Brothers Drake in Columbus, Ohio. This mead was aged over the course of a month in an oak barrel, and it is it is tasty. It's at that perfect level of being I f- chilled. I feel like it would. I feel like it would be tasty. I've had I've had three of theirs so far from this bar, and they're all just wonderful. Uh, over the course of the next few months, I'm going to try to get a bottle each. Yes, have a you, nice you've also stock. you've promised me a few alcohols that whenever you come out to visit me, that you're going to bring. Oh yeah, or whenever you come visit here, whichever one happens first, we'll see. But that's that's a conversation for later. Anyway, yeah. Let's uh, so let's get um, into well before we before we get into uh, the album I gave Robert. Uh, he's Robert actually has a fantastic announcement of his own. He's going to yeah. drop here on track record. So, so what was it? A couple days, a couple days ago on Facebook, um, I posted the track listing and the official release date for uh, what I'm calling a it's it's a collection album. Um, it's called Curios or Curios, um, a collection of productions from 2011 to 2015. Now, this is really kind of a showcase of uh, the electronic side of, of what I do. A lot of the productions that I was making, you know, beats and such um, back in the day. So I'm going to remaster them all. Uh, there's a couple unreleased tracks that I'm going to throw on there uh, with with an artist that I used to work with back in the day. He used to go by the name of Casper. He now goes by the name of Martyr. is his stage name. Um, some some kind of fun stuff there. So that's going to be coming out on Thanksgiving. So look out for that. Uh, that's going to be available for $6 on our Bandcamp, eventideent.bandcamp.com. You could also go to our website, eventideent.com, to look for that as well. Uh, you can stream it also on Bandcamp. Um it's a limited streaming on Bandcamp, but you can stream it on on SoundCloud as well. Um, but yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be good. So it's kind of a the kicker for our our music push that's coming next year. Yeah, 2018 is going to be the big music push for Eventide. We uh, have some great stuff in the works right now. That's the reason why there's no episode of Eventide News this month. Because all the big announcements we have will be coming next month. They're not yeah. they're not ready yet, and we don't want to announce anything until it's finalized. It won't be finalized probably till the end of the month at the latest. So we'll do yeah. a bit. I'll do a bigger Eventide news in December, and I'll, we'll also use that as kind of a platform to talk about our plans going forward in the realm of music. And if you'd like some early information, or maybe to make it a little bit easier. To get a hold of some of that music, you can do that by becoming a patron of the Eventide Entertainment Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash Eventide ENT. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can get access to all kinds of patron only content, such as early access to releases and things like that, as well as as little or as much as 25% off all the way up to 100% off every month to music and albums and content in our band camp, as well as other kinds of cool merchandise, sign posters, things like that. All kinds of great stuff. Again, go to patreon.com slash eventideent and go to our website, eventideent.com for more information about that as well. So there are some sweet rewards on that Patreon, man. For a dollar a month, you get access to the patron-only content, 25% off a full album download from any artist in our catalog, and access to the patron-only hmm. polls. Uh, for as much as 25 a month, you get access to all, all the lower level stuff, as well as access to our monthly patron only online uh, Let's Play or online music concert once we start doing those. Um, and you can also like send us a song uh, that you've done and we'll, we'll we'll feature it. We'll talk about it. We'll promote it. Things like that. So all kinds of just bitching awesome rewards on the Eventide Patreon feed. So make sure you go check that out and become a patron. 
and help keep this show and other shows like it on this network running smoothly. Oh, that's creamy. Isn't it, though? Mm-hmm. Mm, that was great. I don't, I don't know what that noise was. <laughs> so let's, let's <laughs> delve into the <laughs> album that, <laughs> that I gave Robert to talk about this, uh, this week. This was a tough one. We talked about this at the end of last week's show. I was basically down to two artists and two albums. And I inevitably decided on A Night at the Opera by Queen. And what's funny is this past week, when I wasn't listening to Dark Side of the Moon, I was listening to this album and falling back in love with it as well. Uh, Some of you probably know this album as the one that contains a particular song. And I'm sure Robert will get into that at some point. So I, I don't know what else I can say about this one. I'm going to let Robert take it from here. Go ahead, man. All right. So A Night at the Opera came out in 1975. So a couple of years after Dark Side of the Moon. Now, I, I found some interesting tidbits about this. Um, that it was it stated that A Night at the Opera was the most expensive album ever recorded at the time of its release which is you know you think about you don't you don't think about how much it actually costs to produce an album um it's kind of i mean it's being in in my world and your world and our kind of low key type of you know mm-hmm. music label it's kind of you don't think about like these high dollar high budget productions for for right. albums you we, know we we do stuff quality but at a low cost yeah, I mean, well, it's different these days too. I mean, yeah. if you know what you're doing in a in a certain program, then you can make stuff sound okay, you know. Right. Um. So this was the the fourth studio album by Queen, and it's the fourth album produced by Roy Thomas Baker, who produced for The Cars, Journey, Yes, and he even produced a Devo album. Um, really? <laughs> yeah. I knew the other yeah. three. I didn't know about Devo, but go figure. Yeah. Um, now, Yes is actually one of those bands that is underrated to me. Oh, I love Yes. Um, I, I guess they're popular. Um, they have a certain amount of esteem, but you never really hear anyone include them in the conversation, you know? Which is sad. It really is. They're a. Are they, I can't tell. I don't remember if they're in the Hall of Fame yet or not. I'm not sure. They always had that that really interesting guitar work right. on every single song. Um, also, the lead singer for Yes did a collaboration with Tangerine Dream on the Legend soundtrack. Oh, that's right. And made what I believe to be one of the greatest songs ever, and I don't care what anyone says, a song called Loved by the Sun. It's a good song. Oh, my. oh so and good. They were, in fact, they are in the Hall of Fame. They were inducted this year. Wow. Yeah. There you April go. This year. That's so. timely. Um, and also, I love Tom Cruise. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> he makes good stuff. I want to give Tom Cruise a break. He's a, he's a, an he's a, icon. He's a good actor. He's a great, he's a great action hero. Great action star. He does all his own shit. He's more than that, man. Have you seen Eyes Wide Shut? Come no, on. I, I have. That movie is fucked up. I have. He's a great Vanilla actor. Sky? Come on. Yeah, those guys are okay. Anyway. <laughs> uh, anywho. Um, so, so yeah, it was the most expensive album ever recorded at the time of its release. It spent uh, four weeks at number one on the UK albums chart. So, simply stated, this, this record was a big deal. Uh, it wrapped up a year that saw Physical Graffiti by Led Zeppelin and Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd. And again... Like, man, the 70s, like, that was a good time. Absolutely. So much good music. Can you imagine experiencing this for the first time ever? Dude, you need to stop talking. My penis can only get so hard. Like, seriously. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's just the, the thought of that is just one of the most exciting hypotheticals. (laughs) <laughs> to get to yeah to get to hear this in the seventies for the first time, oh man! So so yeah, the, this Queen album was definitely a big deal when it came out, and it remains 
uh, the most beloved Queen album of all time. Um, so to get to the meat of the review, I really enjoyed this album. I'm, I had never listened to it front to back before. Um, and it was a lot of fun. And ultimately, that's how I think I would sum Queen up, is that they are fun. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, if, if you're bored listening to Queen, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, throughout the course of this album, you get opera, hard rock, ballad rock. You get some folk, progressive rock. Um, and listening to it all get woven together by this band is really fun. You've got some serious highs and lows as far as seriousness goes, but all of it is unequivocally a talented band having a really good time. And the the band is clearly unafraid of being different. Um, the, I think anyone would agree that, that Queen is a much different sounding band. And they're also clearly different in how they approach music in general and what uh, going against the grain of what, you know, they think would might be an accepted sound, you know, back then. Um, and I think the, the title of the album really sums up the album itself. Uh, it's really like listening to a theatrical production. Um, it has moments of humor, elation, it's got drama in there. It really, like I said, it, it's got highs and lows as far as the seriousness goes, but it's like it's like watching a play um, in, in acts, you know. Um, one, of my, one of my ultimate favorite things about Queen, and this is one of their really defining features that's in pretty much every single song, and you'll, and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, is their employment of the the high pitched, really cleanly distorted guitar, oh, just about man. every song, and sometimes it's you know melodically layered. Um, what Brian, and they put what Brian May does with the fucking guitar in Queen. Yeah, it's just but, great. but it's crazy because they put that guitar sound in places that you would least expect it uh, to go, um, and it and it catches you off guard, but it's really it's cool to listen to at the same time. Uh, the perfect example of this is on one of the songs on this album called 39. Um, and it's, and that song is the more, it's a more traditional folk sounding song. Um, you know, it's got stand up bass, acoustic guitar, and then you have suddenly this, this high pitched distorted electric guitar and it shouldn't fit, but it absolutely does. Only because it is Queen, you know, um, and th- and that kind of sound good that just continues forward throughout their whole career, really. Um, now, of course, I have to talk about uh, Freddie Mercury's singing ability. Um, I mean, I know it's pretty just like Dark Side of the Moon. Like, what do you say about it? Like, it is, it is godly you know um I no mean, one has just, just the reason they call him the greatest front man in rock music i mean yeah so no one no one has ever denied how great he is but i have to say it oh god um no i'm just saying i have to say that he's great oh um, okay he, he, <laughs> <laughs> the way you phrased that i was like what the fuck are you about to say maybe add me in no 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 there's nothing wrong there he is he is godly um He's, he's got such a great range. He can sing in so many different styles. It's amazing. Um, there's very few vocalists with, with that amount of talent. Um, if any. Um, so, to touch on some of my favorite songs, I liked... Uh, there were two songs that really stuck out to me. Um, one of which was called The Prophet Song. And this song is Queen's longest song ever and has that really long kind of vocal, I don't want to call it a solo. 
in the middle, but it's just like a it's, it's literally Freddie Mercury playing with a delay setting on his voice for like five minutes, and it's amazing. I'd call it solo. I mean, yeah, I mean it's, it's the only it's only his it was, voice, but it's it his voice stacked on top of each other. We call it a yeah. solo if it was any other instrument. It's a solo. Right, right. Um, and a lot of people might be like, you know, what the fuck is this? Like in the middle of a song, you know, like I'm not going to take this seriously, but it shows how, how brazen queen is. And they, they don't care that some might scoff at it, you know, and that vocal part, uh, that solo really gives you an insight into how well. Freddie Mercury understands music and melody. Uh, you you would think by that, by how he employs the notes in that part, and how he sings in that part, you would think that he's, you know, professionally trained. I don't know if he is or not, or was or not, but... Um, Actually, I don't think he was. But it, it goes to show that he has a very high understanding of of like I said, music and melody, you know, what note should come next, that kind of stuff. Um, now my ultimate favorite song on the album, and this is a weird ultimate favorite, uh, but I pride myself on being weird like that. It's called love of my life. (laughs) Uh, and like I said, it's, it's an odd favorite for most people. It's one of their more ballady type songs. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, the melodies are so pleasing. I don't know what it is about it, just the way everything mixes together. And I'm a super sucker for melody. I mean, you know that about me. Oh yeah. Um, and and when that when that you know electric guitar comes in over the piano, man, it's just creamy. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. So good. So. I have nothing negative to say about this album. It is it really is a staple of classic rock and a testament to unabashed and bold songwriting. So uh let's see here. I'm gonna give A Night at the Opera four purple stars out of four. And didn't, didn't have to make me beg for it. <laughs> no, no, you didn't have to. You didn't have to fondle me or anything to get that one. Like I fondled you earlier. Yeah, you did. But Mike, come on, fondle, fondle. Um, now I was on. I was honestly, my first instinct was to go three point five. Mm-hmm. Uh, just because a perfect score is daunting, you know. Um, yeah. But I mean, but then I was like, well. Where, where, where's the point five that just wasn't there and I couldn't come up with anything. Yeah. So it's a four. It's, 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 it's a four out of four. Why not? It's, it is what it is. It's a night at the opera by queen. You know, it's dark side of the moon by pink Floyd. It's yeah. the, you can't, these are the, these are the staples of classic rock. These are the epitomes. Yeah. And I mean, I, there's probably, like one of the other ones I had for you was was Aerosmith. Um, uh, forget what album I was going to give Toys you. Toys in the Attic. Toys in the Attic. Again, like there are just certain albums that you look back on and go, "Yeah, no, that was that was an all star." Yeah, and I think we I think we would have been hard pressed to find albums for this show that we wouldn't have given a four out of four to because. There are just there are so many, well not so many. There's really only a handful of classic rock albums you look back on and go, yeah, could be that one or could be that one. There's probably like five or six total. Right. Um, yeah, it was hard. I mean, there's you know, you've got your 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 five or six bands that are just that defined rock, you know, in in the seventies and eighties. Um. And that's about it. I mean, there's... I think we'd be remiss if we didn't spend some time talking about Bohemian Rhapsody. 
Oh yeah, I, I kind of skipped over. Get, I mean that song. I mean it's it's Bohemian Rhapsody. I mean Bohemian Rhapsody is is legendary on its own. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Uh, I mean that is a song that has that has stood the test of time, to where even shit bags like Kanye West recognize how legendary <laughs> the song is. He may have had the balls. Uh, he may have had the balls to say that, you know, he's the bigger rock star than Freddie Mercury, and for that, that man shall be stoned to death. But to then immediately try, hmm. at least try, to lead his audience in the UK in a rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody shows just how long this song has stood the test of time, that even a Kanye West audience, even a Kanye West can recognize the greatness of this song. Yeah. The fact that Green Day, when playing overseas a couple months ago, played the Bohemian Rhapsody before coming out on stage, and you just watched an entire outdoor arena of 50,000 people erupt. Right, yeah, I saw that video. S- singing yeah. it verbatim. I mean... Right, and that's not an easy thing to sing verbatim. Nope. It requires multiple people. There's no one person who can sing this song verbatim. Yeah. Um, you know, this is just... I mean, and it's not, also, when you find out the story and the meaning behind the song as well. Because when you hear it and you look at it superficially, it's just fun. It's a fun, quirky, all over right. the place, all over the place jam. When you find out what the song is actually about, it kind of turns your world upside down. The fact that he wrote this as this was his way of dealing with the fact that he had AIDS. Because this was right at the kind of the start of the AIDS epidemic. And wow. if, if anything, it, if anything, Freddie Mercury is part of the reason why people started to care so much about it. Because despite there being this weird uh, stigma for gay people, Freddie Mercury was beloved mm-hmm. by everyone. And that he was able to, he was able to find a way, i put my mic stand there, he was able to find a way to, because we often hear people say like, I'm not sure how to put what I'm feeling into words when they're faced with a traumatic event or traumatic reality. Right. Freddie Mercury is a talented enough lyricist and musician. He found a way. Yeah. He found a way to take all of the conflicting thoughts and emotions that come with something like that. And, and he, he put it into words and put it into music. And put it into a song that, again, has stood the test of time. Most definitely. Um, one thing I observed about this album, and I, I alluded to this earlier, is there's a distinct similarity between this album and Dark Side of the Moon, which are only two years apart. They both Ooh. open with building crescendo introductions that then drop off into a slow melodic opening to a song. Interesting. I just, I, I, that's a good catch. Yeah. I I noticed that because I listened to dark side of the moon and then I was like, you know what? I haven't listened to night at the opera all the way through in a while, more recently than dark side of the moon. Cause I'm a huge yeah. queen fan, but I put on, I was like, Holy wait. I was like, my first thought was, wait, did I put on the right album? Oh wait, that's right. Holy shit, they both do that. And <laughs> since Dark Side of the Moon was only two years old at this point and was the monster that it was, it kind of makes sense that Queen would be like, that's a neat idea, let's try that. And they did it their own way. Yeah. But there was that influence there. It's also got one of, I think, the more underrated songs on it, which is You're My Best Friend. We you see think that, that's underrated? We see, I mean, we see it in commercials on TV yeah, yeah, all the time. True. But it's a song that as a, as a whole doesn't get enough love. Oh, you're my best friend. You know, that's that's what's so great about Queen is that like I said 
the the level of seriousness is sometimes lacking, but it doesn't really detract from how great it is. It's hard to put into words. Um, it's just fun. You know, and then and then later in their career when he's talking about fat bottom girls and fuck yeah, bicycle uh, races. Just yeah, like I want to ride my bicycle. Like, bicycle. Bicycle. <laughs> just and yeah, and just kind of like over the top theatrical uh singing. It's just it's there there's nothing else like it. Nothing else. And I am so excited for this Freddie Mercury biopic that they're working on. I can't fucking wait. Cause oh, love- that's right. Because they got they got Remy Malik from Mr. Robot playing him, and I saw some photos of him, some production shots of him, and Jesus Christ, he's a dead ringer for Freddie Mercury. He's got the the stash, he's got the look, he's got the mannerisms and the poses, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, this is wow, it's gonna, gonna be fun. I may cry, I damn well might cry. Oh, because I, I saw okay. well, I saw some video, and they're they're including. They're shooting basically a scene that is their, the the Queen performance at Live Aid, which is one of their right. more legendary live performances. Um, yeah, I, but just man, but again, going back to the staying power of Queen, mm-hmm. that we're able to get a major motion picture about the life of not just the band but the man fronting the band and, and writing the music and writing the lyrics and the fact that we still to this day use we will rock you at every live sporting event on the face of the earth yep that we are the champions is played constantly as part That's of right. victory celebrations and you know the fact that just two year uh, just a year or year and a half ago we saw don't stop me now being used as the uh, the the soundtrack to a major action flick. Whether yeah. it was good is another story, but Queen's got staying power, and so so does Pink Floyd. These are two bands with massive staying power. And I agree. we talk about how if people spent as much time reading books as they do watching football, the world would be a better place. If people spent as much time going back and getting nostalgic with their music. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, like it would, it would just, if people had like, cause I remember when, when God help me, when, when Maroon 5 put out that song moves like Jagger. Okay. I'm going somewhere with this. Just roll with me. <laughs> Maroon, are you? Are yeah, you yeah. though? Because so many people in my class, I was in college at the time in my class were like, who the hell's Jagger anyway? Like who, who's, who's he talking about? <laughs> and like, you want to talk about no. me dropping what I was carrying to turn around with a yeah. look of utter horror on my face, like what? Um, like to the point where it's like you're t- t- fucking Rolex. Are you kidding me right now? Yeah. Um, people who know the songs by Queen but don't know anything about Queen. Yeah. Um, I got to I got to take part in a radio show in college where it was actually hosted by a history major who loved music. And every episode, he would kind of take moments in history and play music that was kind of the soundtrack of that time. And one of the ones we actually did was about the 70s and, and like, you know, Flower Power and the AIDS epidemic and stuff like that. And, and, And Bohemian Rhapsody is one of the ones that we talked about. Okay, but what made that extra special was that you had this guy, a history major, a book, book, book intellectual, a yes. guy with book smarts. Okay, yes, doing a show showing just how influential and how much meaning this old classic music can have, and I do think there are still voices out there today in this genre and in others who could have that kind of lasting impact if people would just take the time to listen. Well, that's always the catch. Yep. If only. If yeah. only. 
Most people these days are like, ah, it's got a beat on it, right? No, I want something I can nod dance my head to. to it, whatever. I need, I need something yeah. I can dance to. No, Wait, where's where's the where's the kick drums? Where's the, where's the bass at? Come I, on, I need music that I can get lost in, motherfucker. Yeah, like, yeah. Like no, whatever no, happened to people like trancing out to some to some psychedelic music? Like what? We used to do that. Come on, I, remember those times where you and me and other people would just sit in your living room or in mine and put on. <laughs> Put on, put on a piece of music and just like kick back and just get lost in it, man. Yeah, those are the best. I do. I try to do that at least once a week because I'll be honest with you, it is a de stressor. Yeah, you find yourself hating life a little bit less if you just take one night a week to get lost in a good piece of music. That is so true. We are just dropping all kinds of woke ass knowledge tonight, aren't we? We woke, son. <laughs> I'm done woked up. You got anything else you want to say about Night at the Opera, man? Um, I think it's uh, it it belongs below uh, Dark Side of the Moon, but I, I know you fight. disagree with me there. I will fight you to the ends of the earth on that one. But, but they're but, both I mean, they're both fours in our book, so I guess they're yeah. pretty much tied, right? That's like that's like. That's like saying how how good do you want your blowjob to be? Good, great, or awesome? Yeah, you're, you're, it's either way you it's win. Still a blowjob. <laughs> exactly, you win either way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how would you describe today's events? Awesome, super, or fantastic? Hmm. Hmm. I'm gonna say excellent. <laughs> I'm gonna go. Yeah. It's. I mean, just damn. This was a good. This was a good episode. Oh. I'm glad we did this one. I needed this. I think I needed yeah. this. This was this was this was refreshing. This was a refreshing experience to get lost in two you, classic pieces of music again. You needed the Milky Mask. I needed the Milky Mask. I did. Sometimes you just need to sit back and let. That's a, a Bukaki reference again, by the way, people. <laughs> need to sit back and let a good album just jizz all over your face. <laughs> <laughs> just take it. Just sit back and take it. He'll, Take that and, sweet milky substance. And the al- the albums are so good, they'll even get you a towel afterwards. They won't make you go get it yourself. Yeah. And not like not like a hand towel. It's going to be a fucking full-size like bath towel. That's been like steamed like you get at a good barber shop before yeah. you get a shave, man. Yeah. It's been pressed. It's slightly warm. Yeah. It's the best. Yeah. Wipe that shit up, bro. The <laughs> whore. <laughs> You whore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even that drunk. <laughs> uh, not compared to last weekend. <laughs> I might be kind of there. I don't yeah, know. Man. Oh, man. I'll, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'll see when I stand up again. I'm savoring the mead. That's what it is. I'm not I'm not drinking the mead like I did the bourbon. Yeah, you don't want to chug the mead. Nah. Well, I've well always... you, don't wanna, you actually didn't want to chug the bourbon either. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> As we found out after the show was over not a good idea but no. meat is something you take your time with yeah um, you savor it plus i've always got like shitloads of bourbon i don't always have mead and yeah. me- meat's classy meat is classier i think so yes oh look at that oh good shit it's like meat is like dragon sperm i think speaking of which <laughs> there was a uh another brand of mead there all their all their uh, labels and and names of it were like mythological. Oh, and of one, course, it's one mead. Of, one of them was called like Dragon's Breath, and it actually had like ghost pepper in it. Ah, oh, stay away from that shit. <laughs> I was tempted. why even do that to yourself? I, like I was tempted. You, you're trying to get drunk, not die. <laughs> oh man. So, uh, Robert, I think I think we got a show here, man. Well, we got to, uh, I mean, did you pick something out for me for next episode? I did. Did you pick something out for me? No. You didn't? No, I haven't thought of anything yet. Really? Yeah, and so now I'm at a pickle because we're, like, doing the show right now. And, like, I don't know what to pick because I've given you, I've already given you, like, my top two most beloved 
albums. That that that's what our theme for next week is going to be is um, Be- beloved albums. Beloved albums that have a very special place in our hearts and minds. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess I could give you like a different Mars Volta album or a different Bright Eyes album. Um, I mean, um, I'm I'm open to you doing the same artist more than once, just not the same album. Yeah. Um. I'm honestly, it's it, I I you know, it's gonna have to be something off the air because I'm gonna have to tell you tomorrow because I have to think hard about it. Let's do this then. Let's let's let it be a surprise for next week. <gasps> Let's let it be Audience. a surprise for next week. So mm. we're going to next surprise week, cream pie. N- next week's show is going to be us giving each other albums that we hold in very high regard in our hearts that have a special place in our hearts and minds. But we're not going to tell you guys what they are. We want you guys to wait and be surprised next week. Yeah, because I mean, Most, mostly again, Robert this show is about us, not about you fucking people. Exactly. We love you, and please keep listening. But it, we're the ones picking the albums and listening to them, good or bad. So, yeah, we I'm love you. We, I, we, we love, love you. you. I'm just playing. Come on, we're busting your balls. That's all we're doing. <laughs> hey, um, uh, audience, if you do love us, will you will you go see if there's any action on the hashtag Gary Busey eating potato salad? <laughs> I I haven't checked. Because I only made that up just as like a gag, and actually I haven't mentioned Gary Busey for a couple episodes now. So hey, Gary, um, and uh, but I want to see if there's been any hits on that hashtag. Maybe even the man himself. You think he uses Twitter? Oh, I I feel like Twitter would be the one of the best outlets for Gary Busey, especially now that they got that 280 character limit. Oh, snap. They doubled their character limit. Double up. Double stuffed, boy. <laughs> um, anywho. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I look forward to that, though, because, you know, I'm sure whatever you pick for me is going to be that I will like it. Um, I hope so, because it really is. It really does have a special place in my heart. Like, no bullshit. Like, this is album it? means a fucking lot to me. I, I, is it finally going to be an Avenged Sevenfold album? Not yet. Not yet? Not yet. Hmm. Not yet. We'll I, get there. I've, I've never we'll get listened there. to Avenged Sevenfold. I'm just waiting Ever? for the day that you give it to me. No. I, well, I don't know. I, that that, that kind I, of... I, I really I'm not a huge fan of that like metalcore, I guess. We, well, we had a long discussion about metalcore in a previous yeah. episode, but well, and the thing about Sevenfold is they transcend so many genres. They don't; they've never held to just one specific style. But that's yeah. a that's a conversation for when. Now I'm going to be really picky about which one I give you and when, since you've never heard them before. Well, that's fine. So yeah. All right. All right. So yeah, I think we got a show this week. Make sure you guys tune in again next week for the special surprise episode. Of albums that are near and dear to our hearts. Uh, make sure you guys check us out online, eventidnt.com. Go to Spreaker, follow the show, like it, download it, listen to it, share it with your friends. Hashtag Gary Busey eating potato salad. Yeah. And uh, make sure you check out Citizen Seven's Curios release coming on Thanksgiving Day. That's the 23rd, by the, the way. 23rd, by the way. And uh, we'll see you guys next week, I guess. Farewell, my Lillen. Later.